Hello and welcome to another free code session. My name is Jason Bach and I'm going to start off on a good note. Um, I finally have Dubsharp compiling to IL, so it all seems to work. So that is a good thing. Uh, let me demo something here. Um, oh, where, where can I go? I can put some code over here which you can't see, but that's okay. The way to get this to work too is a little awkward. And speaking of awkward, I got to start getting used to the terminal um, because, for example, if I just want to change the font to 20 and try Cascadia code, it always gives this problem, which is like, ugh. So then it changes it, but then the next time I come through, it doesn't keep it. I know, first world problems, but uh, where do I want to go there? Nope. No, 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 not WCF. Uh, okay, so what this is going to run is essentially the code for, this is the Fibonacci sequence code, okay? So I have this one project that has one file, and then that compiles the compiler, which then in turn also compiles the Dubsharp code I'm giving it, runs the res result in executable code. Okay, so if I say .NET run, it's going to take a little bit of time. If you follow Emo's compiler series, this, he's also experiencing this too, because I, I, I think there'll be ways to <clears throat> clean this up and make this a little nicer. Um, but at the end of the day, now we start seeing the Fibonacci sequence. So that's good. Okay, let's over here. Let's get the code for i9 bottles. We'll put that over here. Come back there. Run it again. Okay, so now we should see 99 bottles once all the compilation stuff. Oh, it would help. It would help if I actually saved. <laughs> the file. <laughs> there we go. It's early morning, gotta get my coffee. And there you go. You, you, I really wish I would have recorded this, but I did it over the weekend and I and um I just wanted to focus on this stuff <clears throat> because writing IL is a lot like well, I don't know if it's like surgery. I've never actually had to perform surgery. But I would imagine somewhat analogous to, you know, like brain surgery in the sense of you do one little thing wrong and every, you'll, you will see exceptions that you've never even heard of before. Um, CLR, bad image, right? Oh, it's just, it's awful. And, you know, this is stuff that I played with <clears throat> 20 years ago and off and on throughout the years. So... It's nothing new, it's just I haven't done it in a while. So the tools that I used a lot were things like IL Spy to come into here and go, okay, you know, if, if something wasn't right in the generated IL, you would sometimes see it if you just went to the C Sharp code because IL Spy couldn't quite decompile it, and so then it wouldn't show the right thing here. Um, or, you know, or I'd have to go into the IL and, and then figure out what's going on. I'm going to keep this up because I'm going to get into something that, you know, improvements now I want to make. Now that I have it, I think, at least functional, you know, the programs that I've found, I can now build. So now it's a matter of going through this stuff and going, how do I actually, you know, handle this correctly and, and make things a little better? But... Um, so I was, I was using IL Spy, which is a great tool. A couple times I tried to use IL Dasm. It's, it's a rough tool. It's a very rough tool. I don't think, it doesn't look like it's changed in many, many years. And arguably, maybe it doesn't need to. But um, it just, yeah, it, it is what it is. So, um, so there's this tool. And then I'm going to come over here 
pull off a tab so you can see it. And if you've never heard of this site, it is an amazingly good site. Um, it's called Sharp Lab IO. So one thing I wish is that they had whoever built this. Maybe I should put in a issue. You can't pull this middle thing over left and right. Sometimes it was something that would be really helpful when I was looking at stuff. But what you can do in here is you can just put in things like um, I don't know why it do, where it puts the curly braces at the end. It drives me nuts. So you can come in here and you can say like list of string values. It doesn't know what a list is. You see the errors. I can say I'll put a using statement in. I don't think it has remove. Yeah, it doesn't know unnecessary usings, but that's okay. And then I can say I'll put in a Yeah, yeah, well, no, no, we'll do this. We'll say, come on. If values count zero, print console, right? Oh, because, yeah, no, I took away that, so that's okay. Using system. I said using system. What? Oh, that's a bug. Huh. Okay. Using system, come back over here, right line. So you get IntelliSense, um, items exist. And then you can come over here and you can see the generated stuff. If I say debug, you'll notice that the generated code gets a little bit more verbose in part to make it easier to do debugging, but it doesn't try to optimize things out as much. You know, if I go back to release, you'll notice that in, loc in debug, it stores a local value, which is the actual result of this, you know, the if statement. In release, it gets a little smarter and realizes it doesn't have to do that. So this tool is very indispensable because I could try things out, see what the generated IL looked like, and then put that into Dubsharp for like the, the update counts where you do one pound two or something like that. I had the evaluator, so we're actually writing that evaluator class. I'm going to come back to this in a second. But writing the evaluator was very helpful, actually, because I could look at, well, if I want to do a, where is it? Like these update line counts or unary line update line counts. This is what I essentially wanted to generate, more or less. And so I kind of create this code in here and then see what's there and then build it. It still took time. I mean, it's, and I found another site called like Cecilifier or something like that. Um, do I still have that over here? Do I have that memorized? Cecilifier.me. Okay. Let me just rip this off so you can see it. So you could enter in C sharp code here and then it would generate code that would generate the code you just wrote in a NIL using mono.cecil. It, it was okay. It's not, it, it wasn't quite perfect. You know, it wasn't the best, but it was another. So, you know, was, I, I was finding a lot of things using these tools, you know, using these tools to find a lot of things and, and make it easier-ish, but it was still a lot of just very carefully putting things in and making sure it all worked. By the way, the reason I put this code up here is because um, where I work, this came up on a Teams um, channel, which people looked at this and went, well, wait a minute, the null conditional operator, the Elvis operator, is supposed to take the thing on the left, and if it's not null, it does the thing on the right, otherwise it returns null. So if it does that, then how can this actually, you know, you're comparing null to, or like a nullable int to a zero, and how does this work, blah, blah, blah. And does this compile? And I, I love, I love, and I hate questions like that, um, which is, does this compile or not? You have a compiler. Ask the compiler. You know, <laughs> ask it the question. That I get that we should understand how a language works, and that we shouldn't have to necessarily use a compiler to figure out, like, if I do here var, 
x is equal to values dot count plus one. Well, what should x be? You know, well, and then you could start saying, well, x is an unused variable. Why are you even having it in there in the first place? And maybe values is null, even though you're in C sharp eight and you're using null reference types and blah blah blah. You know, it keeps going on and on and on. But my point is, is when that question got asked is, well, go to the compiler. And you don't have to use a console app. You can just come to sharplab.io. You can say create a gist if you want to. You can take this URL, which I think has the code that you just wrote embedded in there somehow. Um, so I don't think it saves it on its site, but you can pass that around as well. You can use different branches to try out new things in C Sharp, like attributes and local fun functions, function pointers, native ends, pattern matching improvements, right? The problem is, is that if you try these, I don't know if it actually explains, like you could try feature source generators, but I don't know, I'm not gonna do it now, but I, I've tried it before, and I don't really know if it actually tells you, well, this is what you can try, you know, which is, a it's a site that somebody created and you know it's it's got its good things but there's things i wish that would have a little bit more in any event the point of this code is what is actually happening and this is where this also needs improvement because where is this code being related to this code well if you read this you're loading the first arg which is this not the zeroth arg if it's an instance method the zeroth arg is actually the this parameter so that's something I learned many, 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 many years ago. So you load the first arg. You break it false to label 16, okay, which is way down here, and you're done. Now you're going, wait, what did that actually do? What this actually does is it checks the value of null. It checks values to see if it's null first. And the way you do that is you just compare it to um, use this break false up code. Okay. So if it is null, you literally just pop out of the function. You're done. Okay. Only if it's not null, then because break false will pop the value off the stack, you then have to load it again. Then you will call get count because properties in .NET actually have methods that map to it. And in C sharp, the convention is the getter is get underscore the property name a setter is set underscore property name. There's actually, um, there's a third type for property. And I forget if it's dot other or what it is in, in uh, the metadata IL format, but there is a way to actually specify a third thing you can do with the property, which nobody ever uses. But that's what get count does. We then load the constant zero this is one nice thing about this is that if you hover over these, you get IntelliSense, though it doesn't work work very well with the dark mode. And because you like the dark blue there for the opcode name is not that easy to see. OK, and then break less than or equal to BLE. And if it is less than or equal to that, then you, again, you pop out of the method. Otherwise, you'll actually load the string and call right line. So. This just, you know, I, I, people were seeing, well, this should be an error. This shouldn't work. This is not doing And I'm like, no. Build a program, which you can easily do with Sharp Lab IO. Look at the IL, you know, and see what the results are. And it was clearly doing uh, the right thing. It was not an error. There was no problem. In this case, it doesn't do the thing on the left and do the thing. What's doing is it's actually saying, well, wait a minute is the thing on the left null, then don't even like try to produce, if, if you do something like um, var x is equal to values count, now you're gonna get an error because it, it doesn't know, oh no, I'm sorry, it doesn't. I, I was, I was it's what x is gonna be is a necessary assignment, but it's gonna be a nullable there. Okay, so it was just cool to use this because I, I 
basically reinforce the point to everybody, which is it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't even matter what the documentation necessarily says or does not say. What matters is what the compiler or the code or the application actually does. Yeah. So many times I've heard people say, but the docs say this. Not even about a compiler, just an application or something you're writing. But the docs say you should do this. But it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, what matters is what the code is doing. Now, the code could be doing something that's technically wrong. The code could be doing something that truly isn't correct. And then you fix it. Okay. But ultimately, what matters in this case is what's going to be produced and what's going to run. In this case, what people have to understand is, no, this is perfectly fine. You just checking for count and you're putting a guard around the values to make sure that it's not null. Okay. All right. Enough babbling about that. Let me close this out here. Come back to this code because now, speaking of guarding code, there's a bunch of issues I put on Dubshort because I've wanted to, let's make sure I've got all my changes checked in. I got, yeah, take that off. Very minor changes. <laughs> okay. So one of the first changes I want to do is, let me pull this off here so you can see it. Don't omit a defer guard until necessary. So what you might have seen here is on every line that's generated, I'm checking to see should statement be deferred. Because okay, then you don't want to run it. Well, that's true, except arguably this first thing here doesn't need it. Because each line in its associated statements, you don't need to make this check until you detect the first time that a call to defer has happened. Then after that, you have to put these guards around all of the, um, all the statements that happen after that. Okay. And arguably... If I had a, um, a program that had a lot of statements after, which I don't with 99 bottles of beer on the wall, okay, what I could do is just omit the guard. Actually, that's a good point. I just realized something. What I could do is once I detect that I call defer, then put the guard in place because nothing after it should happen. Okay. And then what I could do is when I'm done generating the method, then like I'll have to put a break to say this break to some point, And then I have to capture that break at the, um, the emitter level in my, in my object. And then when I come down to, Emitting all the statements, then I will say instructions dot append that because then they'll, they'll basically put the closing brace on, on the line. Let me actually do something where I take this code. Does it remember? Yes, it does. Okay, so we're gonna do that. Oh crap! I <laughs> close this window. I should know better, right? I should know better. Uh, so, okay, dot and run. Because what I'm going to do now is compile the Fibonacci sequence. That actually has an example where, um, yes, where there are multiple statements after a defer. Okay, we can stop this because I don't want that to run forever. Let's refresh that. Is it line one? Yeah. So here you can see that this, again, should not really have this. There's no need, need for this. A defer shouldn't have it either. But then everything after it should. But I don't need to have the three checks after it. I can just do one, and that's it. So that's what I'm going to try to do this morning. So if we come back here, this is issue 10. So we're going to put in a branchy branch. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Um, 
um, 10 optimize defer guard. New branch, great branch. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Publish the branch, sure. We're over here, okay, <clears throat> now, what did I say I needed to do? I need to have, <coughs> where do I do the guard? I think it's called defer guard. I guess not. Okay. Oh, I'm in the evaluator, that's why. We want to be in the emitter. Defer guard, there we go. Okay, so this does that. Okay, so what we want to do now is split the screen. So that's up there. Come down here, go to a call expression. Okay. So once I do a defer, here is where I now need to put that. Okay. And what I want to say here is this defer guard label. Okay. Generate field. Seems good to me. Okay. We need to put a this here. Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> Five things are running through my head right now. Um, I want to do this. So first of all, let's get it out of here now. Okay. And I'll have to remember to close it off because if I don't, I'm going to get an error. Okay. What I want to do though is I want to say admit call expression. But I only want to do this if I should. So private bool should emit defer guard label because it's possible although highly stupid to do this <laughs> the whole point of doing well i guess this is now pushing something even if you would do if you would issue a defer there, you you really need to have one statement afterwards so um what i need to put in this i love this stuff Actually, it's silly to have a defer call with no other, without any statements follow, without at least one statement after the call. Put a check in the parser, maybe, to catch this and add a diagnostic. Okay, so I basically talked myself out of what I just did. Why are you erroring? Oh, yeah, because it could be nullable. It could be nullable. Okay, so we're going to come back down here. We're going to assume that we put that check in there. So, yes, when I come into a defer, put this in here because when I'm done emitting a line, if this dot defer guard label is that, whoops, I'll processor append that, and you're done. Okay. So in the cases where you wouldn't need it, it's not going to just automatically put it in there. It's only going to be in there after you've called a defer. That's the intent, okay? Did I do it right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's run that again, and let's see how many errors I get. There is a task now that I have to add a lot of unit tests because I've gotten to the point where things are stable-ish. Okay, that didn't fail, which is good. Let's take a look at... Well, when I refresh this, boom, does exactly what I want, which there's no check until you've called a defer. 
and if your statement shouldn't be deferred, then you're fine. Um, and I think line five, I wonder if you can hear the thunder. We got thunder going on around here. Yeah, now there's no check. So it's a small thing, but this is one of the things that you'd want optimized in there. You wouldn't want to have blindingly putting in these Boolean checks, which would be really, really, really fast. But again, it's one thing you don't need to do unless it's absolutely necessary. So, you know, like constant folding and other things like that that I haven't even looked at. But um, I like this because it was one of those things I saw. I'm like, yeah, that's actually a good thing. We don't, we don't want to do that. Now, I've done this. Okay. But <laughs> I actually haven't um, put in the other check. And so now I have to sit there and go, where would that be? Would that actually be in the parser? Is that arguably the parser's job to do that kind of error check? Like I can report a missing semicolon. Um, I could parse a call expression. I don't think it's the job of the parser to do this. I think it's the job of the binder. So if I come into the binder and I say bind line statements. Well, you, then you get a line statement. And we do have yeah, diagnostic bag. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we can come in here and see a bound line statement. Okay. Now what I need to keep track of is did you ever bind a call to to defer and then have no other statements after it. Because if that's the case, um, so what I need is to have a flag that says, you know, was defer called. And then I need to have another Boolean that says, statement exists after defer call or something like that. I don't know. Um, I'm going to take a break and record a couple others this morning um, and stop right now because I'm pretty much near the end of the time for the video. But um, I've got this to finish and then I've got some other things on the list to do. So I've got some things I can record this morning and um, generate all sorts of material. So coffee break. I'll be right back. Well, not in this one because you have to wait till the next episode is published. So thank you all for watching. Leave comments and questions below. See you in the next episode.